will test your vision into more manageable pieces using TV, books and the internet. So it's easier to take in and much more relaxing. For your free Key Stage 3 bite size revision guide, call 08456 101533. It's a case of touch and go for Truda. He's not breathing very well. It's a wait and see situation for Maria. We've got a much bigger problem. And it's Fiona's turn to watch and learn. A couple of weeks, I think that hopefully that will be healed. Caring, curing, and comforting. Bets in practice, Tuesday at 8 on BBC One. The BBC News now on BBC One with Sean Williams. Tony Blair tells the gunman don't let past symbols threaten the peace. Now's a critical moment, he says, but weapons play no part in the future. Two of the world's wealthiest men get together to bid for the lottery. And a Rwandan war crime suspect is arrested in southeast London. Good evening. The Prime Minister has told paramilitaries in Northern Ireland that they can't let the symbols of the past destroy the peace process. In a speech to Labour's local government conference, Mr Blair said all the parties must know whether the IRA would disarm by May. His comments come a day after an IRA statement which said the arms issue had to be dealt with in an acceptable way. This was an emotional appeal from Tony Blair to the gunmen. The crisis deepens, but the language has softened. On Thursday, the Northern Ireland Secretary angered the IRA by accusing it of betrayal. Today, the Prime Minister told them he wasn't accusing anyone of breaking their word. He understood Republicans saw disarming as a symbol of surrender. There comes a moment when you decide whether the symbols you cling to are more important than the vision you really believe in. And this is the moment now, therefore, when we simply need to know. Because this issue of decommissioning is not going to change, it's not going to disappear. It's not going to alter in its essentials. It's just got to be confronted and resolved now. As Gerry Adams continues behind-the-scenes dialogue with both governments and with the IRA, Sinn Féin is considering legal action if the government suspends Stormont, which it believes would breach the Good Friday Agreement. Could there be a more disastrous or negative message sent back in? to those constituencies that actually have guns, that have control over guns, and that we've been trying to convince should actually surrender those guns or should consider destroying those guns in the interest of a democratic settlement. The British government, I think, are making a very, very serious mistake. Republicans are sure to have noted the more conciliatory tone struck by the Prime Minister in his appeal to them on decommissioning. But they still see Friday's deadline as an ultimatum from unionists and from the government. The Republican movement seems unprepared for decommissioning, unprepared too for the suspension of Stormont. George Eakin, BBC News, West Belfast. Two of the world's best-known entrepreneurs have told the BBC they're joining forces to bid for the lottery. Sir Richard Branson has teamed up with the founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates. Mr Gates said his technology would broaden the appeal of the game, and Sir Richard claimed if they won the licence, they'd create a millionaire a day. Well, I think... A new team, the world's richest man and Britain's best-known entrepreneur, pitching together to run the lottery. It was Richard Branson's idea. Bill Gates will add his computer know-how to put the game on the internet. Isn't there an approach that can cost a lot less money and can be a, a richer experience for the people who want to use it? And so that's, that's part of the vision. They're promising to run the lottery on a non-profit basis encouraging more people to play and ensuring someone becomes a millionaire every day. It's something that I'd talked to Bill about. Um, he liked the philosophy behind it and he's put his technical expertise into it, which you know, obviously we're very, very appreciative of. There are likely to be six bidders when the National Lottery Commission takes its decision in June. The government doesn't have a say, but it's clearly pleased to see Bill Gates in the lineup. We need a good, strong competition between different uh, competitive bids. And uh, I think this probably means that we are in for a good, strong competition. Uh, I welcome that because obviously what I want to see is the best possible deal for the good causes. The Royal Opera House is just one of the causes that's already benefited from the lottery. Ransom and Gates say their lottery would bring in an extra £2 billion for schemes like this. 
But for now, the two multimillionaires will have to wait and see if their number will come up. Emma Adwin, BBC News. A Rwandan army officer suspected of genocide and crimes against humanity has been arrested in southeast London. The International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda wants to extradite Thasis Mavunya, a former commanding officer, to face charges from the 1994 civil war. Our correspondent Raghi Omar has been following the story. Colonel Tharsis Mouvouni has been living quietly in London for nearly two years. The BBC tracked him down to a public library in southeast London in December. These are the only detailed pictures of the man who is accused of being responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. He refused to answer any questions. It's said that you were a military commander in Butari and Gikongoro in southern Rwanda during the genocide. Can you confirm that? The British government and the International War Crimes Tribunal have known about his case for at least a year. Only now has he been arrested to face possible extradition. He and his family have been living in London as political refugees. But Colonel Mouvouni has a very different past. This is Butare in southern Rwanda, where Colonel Mouvouni was the most senior military commander during the genocide in 1994, in which up to a million people were slaughtered. Just outside Butari is one of the memorials to the genocide. When the killings began, 50,000 people came here to hide, but soldiers under Colonel Mavunyi's command hunted them down and killed them. The remains of 30,000 people are kept here in 72 chambers. There is no question that he's uh, one of the big fish to, that should be uh, brought to justice. These are the leaders we are looking for. Last week, the war crimes chief prosecutor finally came to London to ask the British government for Colonel Mavunyi's extradition. We're trying to do our best and, you know, uh, justice is uh, sometimes not so speed, but we will come. Colonel Mavunyi is in police custody. Tomorrow he'll appear at Bow Street Magistrates Court. Raghi Omar, BBC News. It's emerged that it was the pressure from the sponsors of the Millennium Dome which led to the resignation of the chief executive, Jenny Page. The companies had demanded management changes after bad publicity and poor attendance figures. Pierre-Yves Gabot, who's credited with turning around the fortunes of Disneyland in Paris, will be the new chief executive. There was a steady stream of visitors to the Millennium Dome today, but however impressed they are with the exhibits, the big sponsors have been furious about what they've got in return for their money so far. 27 companies, including many household names, pledged £150 million of the £750 million cost of the dome. But in the short time it's been open, it's suffered a catalogue of problems, not least attendances well below target for the dome to break even. Manpower, the world's biggest employment agency, sponsors the work zone. But a ticketing shambles delayed its plans to give away free computer training. Manpower was in no doubt about what the Millennium Company needed to do. Pull their socks up, get over the teething problems, put in place a hit squad of, of uh, experienced operational management who are able to convert the building, the construction of this major site, this exciting project, into a world-class tourist attraction. Achieving that prompted a crisis meeting which led to the sudden departure yesterday of Jenny Page as chief executive of the new Millennium Experience Company. But the problems don't end there. Research carried out with the BBC's money programme shows that the constant hostile publicity has been extremely damaging to the sponsors. Analysis of press coverage since the Dome opened found only 13% to be favourable, with a value based on the cost of advertising space put at £600,000. But negative publicity was costed at £2 million. In other words, the sponsor's investment has done them more harm than good. You don't go into sponsorship to create headlines that are critical of what you're doing. That's, it's not what a business, and certainly blue chip companies, they don't need that sort of criticism. Tomorrow, the French man who made a success of Disneyland in Paris takes charge, and there may be yet more management upheaval in the mission to salvage the Dome's fortunes. John McIntyre, BBC News. And you can see the full report on the sponsors in the Millennium Dome on the Money Programme tonight at 7.30 on BBC Two. An Afghan plane with nearly 200 people on board has been hijacked. The Boeing 727 was on an internal flight from the capital Kabul to Mazar-i-Sharif in the north of the country. But it was forced to fly to neighbouring Uzbekistan and on to Kazakhstan. 
the airline is now thought to be heading towards Moscow. The airport at Tashkent in Uzbekistan was the first stop for the hijacked plane after it left Afghanistan. The airport terminal was evacuated and armed police took up positions. The plane spent four hours on the ground and ten of the 178 people on board were said to have been allowed to leave the aircraft before it was refuelled and took off. As the plane made another landing, this time in Kazakhstan, Afghan officials here in Moscow were at a loss to explain why a domestic flight had been hijacked. Uh, we don't know many things about the situation. Uh, who is uh, this people? Uh, how it's happened? Ariana, the state airline of Afghanistan, has an aging fleet of aircraft, and regular international flights were suspended last year after the imposition of UN sanctions against the Taliban for its refusal to hand over Osama bin Laden, the man wanted for questioning in connection with the bombing of US embassies in Africa. With unconfirmed reports that the hijacked plane could now be destined for Moscow, the Russian authorities will no doubt be bracing themselves for its possible arrival. Peter Biles, BBC News, Moscow. Russia's acting president, Vladimir Putin, has announced an end to Moscow's military operation in the Chechen... ...but nevertheless, Ken will probably...